talk to the participants. At our general board of directors meeting Thursday after next, Paul Strasbaugh, Chamber's Executive Vice President, will give a report on the economic growth of the Oklahoma City area since the first of the year and will cover progress made on the 1970 goals of the Chamber. U.S. National Championship Arabian Horse Show will return to Oklahoma City for the second year, September 3rd through the 7th. And you're all invited to come out and see these performances. And to be real brief, during a 30-day period next month, month of September, we will have programs to dedicate the new Mummers Theater to honor a fine Oklahoma City industry, Mecklenburg Duncan, and to honor Oklahoma teachers. Work will get underway on the Chambers program for 1971. These are just highlights, and you all have an invitation to take part in all of these events and programs. And now for our honored guest and featured speaker on today's forum. To introduce him, it is my pleasure to call on a man who himself has made major contributions to our entire state for many years. I'm pleased to call on Dr. E.T. Dunlap, Chancellor of the Regents of Higher Education for the state of Oklahoma, who has had the opportunity of working closely with Dr. Dennis. Dr. Dunlap. Chairman, honored guests Jim Bennett, members of the head table, and ladies and gentlemen. It is uh, an unusual honor that I have today to present to you a gentleman that you know much about. Really, it is an easy chore to introduce a man like Jim Bennett to a group of people who know him. But it is really uh, a privilege to say just a few words uh, before he uh, addresses you. <coughs> As most of you are aware, the State Regents for Higher Education began a study of Oklahoma higher education for long-range planning some 10 years ago, about 1961 or 62, which obviously included the University of Oklahoma Medical Center as a part of the Oklahoma State System of Higher Education. In December of 1963, the Regents authorized a depth study of the Medical Center for long-range planning, planning that would be designed to meet the medical education needs of the people of our state and of the Southwest in the years ahead. <clears throat> it was about this stage of the game that Jim Dennis first entered the picture in Oklahoma medical education in a formal way. Dr. Mark Everett, who had been Dean of the School of Medicine for 17 years, was due to retire on June 30, 1964. And President George Cross of the university appointed a search committee to find his successor with the instructions to find the best qualified man in the United States. Probably never did a committee take its instructions quite as literally. Jim Dennis was presented, was persuaded to come uh, back home to Oklahoma and to have a go of building a major health center here in Oklahoma City. <coughs> Even before he took office in September 1964, Jim began his work at his new job. He immediately tuned in with the Chancellor and the State Regent in helping to complete the comprehensive study of the Medical Center, which was published in July of 1965. Since that time, he has done everything which could have been expected of a leader and an, and an administrator in education, in medical education, to begin and make a substantial step forward in the implementation of plans that grew out of the study which he helped to finalize. Now, looking over Dean Dennis's accomplishments, I'm reminded of a statement made by Lamar Hunt, millionaire owner of the Kansas City Chiefs. Mr. Hunt was having his private offices redecorated and commented, 
I gave the interior decorator an unlimited budget, and he exceeded it. <coughs> I cannot think of anyone who has so aptly assumed Jim Dennis' accomplishments, but the president of the University of Arkansas, uh, David Mullins, in a recent comment. And uh, David Mullins, uh, Jim Dennis' new boss, uh, made this statement. Not only is Dr. Dennis highly qualified and experienced in the administrative leadership of a major medical center, but he has also demonstrated his capacity to work effectively with the medical profession, with legislators, with government officials, with other educated, educational leaders, and with the public generally. The prophet said, where there is no vision, the people perish. The obverse of that is equally true, that where there is vision, the people have life and they have it more abundantly. Jim Dennis has exhibited the vision to create a $200 million health center in Oklahoma City, which brings together public and private, as well as local, state, and national interests to work toward the common good here during the 1970s. This health center will last as a continuing monument, not only to his vision, but to his heart and his mind as well. The Quaker theologian Elton Trueblood has said, a man has begun to understand the true meaning of life when he plants shade trees under which he knows full well he will never sit. Jim Dennis has planted deep-rooted shade trees on Northeast 13th Street, which will grow tall and wide in the early years ahead. They will provide a huge shade for the good of the people of this state and the Southwest in the years to come. Jim, we hate to see you leave Oklahoma. If you're going to be nearby and you're leaving something here, then you leave the state. Pleasure to present to you, Jim Bennett. Thank you. I I agree with Dewey Bartlett, or was it Henry Bowman? When people stand, I get nervous. I'm afraid they're going to leave the room. <laughs> After that eloquent introduction, and one I deeply appreciate from a man I've learned to respect, whom I have enjoyed, with whom I've enjoyed working so much, uh, almost anything I would say might seem redundant, but I'm going to say it anyway. I was reminded by one of my friends that uh, at a chamber forum you were expected not only to be uh, eloquent but to have a few good stories. And I, I realize that uh, I don't hear any funny stories anymore. And maybe that's the time somewhere. Uh, I was talking about this with my wife last night and uh, I was trying to work, work and weave in some uh, anecdotes to the uh, highlight some of my comments, and uh, all of a sudden we began to realize that uh, this is a political year and a political uh, climate right now, even the governor is nigh, and uh, uh, by George, and uh, I, I had a darn good Okie story but half of the room will get dewy-eyed, and the other half will pull a cannon out and blast me. <laughs> I was going to talk about that budget we exceeded and the problem of inflation, and uh, surely if I do, everyone will want Bryce controls. <laughs> uh, it's a little slow on that. The visitors will not understand some of these points. <laughs> I've entitled my uh, talk, The Oklahoma Health Center, Future and Concerns. I really am not overly worried about the future. The future is here, right in front of me. This is the greatest 
first team of medical leadership in this nation right at this table. It took me six years to con them into it, but they're here. And they have the message, they have the word. And they have the backing. And when you heard the introductions today, if you listened at all, you noticed that almost every segment of our society and of this community and of this state was represented in the citizen umbrella group that has made this great concept possible. And this is what is unique about what is developing here. And it could only happen as a partnership. Now, I would love to talk off the cuff, but if I do, I'll be punny and I'll be here till 3 o'clock and there wouldn't be anyone else here. So I'm going to stick to my manuscript and then if there's any time left, I'll, I'll seize it. Six years ago this month, I returned to my home state, my hometown. I'm living within three miles of where I spent my boyhood. And to my alma mater. And I quickly became aware of <coughs> the fact that I really had deeply rooted, a deeply rooted Oklahoma heritage with its emphasis on a sense of personal responsibility, personal integrity, and open communication of feelings. Now, some of these Oklahoma traits that were ground into us in my generation get us into trouble. I'm probably leaving because I was so stubborn about what I thought was right, but it is, it is a great feeling to have been away from these kinds of stable roots and to return to them after 24 years. I was really very much amazed at the alienation that existed at that time of the medical school from uh, its community, but I soon realized that the innumerable complaints really represented symptoms of a more fundamental dis-ease. And my diagnostic impression suggested that the medical center had become an economically depressed intellectual island on 13th Street, and its occupants were essentially being forced to look to Washington in terms of their hopes and their ambitions for the future. And that Oklahoma, a state that is and was depended on its medical center for the production of a significant portion of badly needed professional personnel had pretty much forfeited many of its responsibilities. Frustrations on both sides were very obvious. Yet, this provided what I think was and is the key to the future. And I want the people right in front of me to Remember this, I've tried to remind them, but this is the one thing you must remember. Since a state society is dependent on its medical school and its medical center, and the school itself cannot thrive without adequate state support, it is obvious that success is only a matter of exploring the mutuality of dependence the mutuality of dependence of this state and this medical center. And for a decade, this concept was lost. We at the medical center must strive to meet the state's needs. And the state, on the other hand, must strive to provide the medical center the support required to do the job. With these thoughts in mind, and along with the planning that was going on with the state regents, we carefully articulated a statement of mission for the medical center on which all the planning for the future has been based. This is really a philosophy, a credo, if you wish, and I was amazed to find that it attracted so much attention, even at national levels. And it did so only because almost no medical center had really thought about its mission. What we stated, was that the goal of the University of Oklahoma Medical Center is to serve its society by fulfilling its academic and medical social responsibilities, and here is the key. 
and, and medical social responsibilities in harmony with the needs and the expectations of our people. In harmony with the needs and the expectations of our people. And I say to you, my colleagues, if you keep this in mind, you're going to have the greatest support of any medical center in this country. But you've got to meet those needs, and you have to be in harmony with your society. If our medical society, our medical center, I should say, and I'm speaking five, six, seven years ago, if we were to relate to needs, we first had to establish a relation to this community and to this state. So our initial approach was based on the philosophy that Oklahoma's growing needs as well as our own could only be met if we could some way coordinate and combine the medical center efforts with those of our leading citizens, our practicing professional colleagues, our community, private hospitals, our local, state, and federal agencies in the development of a long-range master plan that went far beyond a concept of just an academic center. In conformity with this philosophy, we propose that the redevelopment of the medical center be in the form or the nature of a health campus in which the university facilities would provide core programs, but would be only one of many institutions representative of all segments of our state society and our economy, but all of them having the common goal that of meeting the state needs or health manpower. It was at about this point in time, late in 64 as I recall, I ran into some very frustrating and discouraging periods. And I could give you a good hour's talk about some very fascinating things that happened in those first few months, including being investigated by the legislature before I even knew where the till was, and uh, a few little things like that. Uh, but I was a little blue, and uh, the faculty at that time did not really know me, and when you started about meeting health needs of the community in 1964, uh, you were threatening uh, the philosophy of every academician at that time. But there was a man named Stanley Draper right down here, whom I had not really known. I had heard of him for years, but I didn't know him. I found out that Stanley has been known to think big. This man grasped the significance of what we were trying to synthesize. And he also sensed my loneliness and frustration. And he and Bill Morgan Kane, Mr. William Morgan Kane, uh, was the head of some committee at that time related to uh, the medical center or health affairs. He and Bill Kane invited me down to this hotel, as I recall, and in uh, the executive suite, he gathered together people like Mr. Dean McGee and Mr. E.K. Gaylord and Harvey Everest and Bill Kane and uh, uh, the names we all know so well and uh, gave me an opportunity to communicate a concept. And this was the turning point. I might have been in Arkansas five and a half years sooner if uh, we hadn't had this point. And my concept of a Blue Ribbon Citizen Umbrella Foundation caught fire. Now this was about three to four years ahead of the federal government's push to have what they call consumer advisory groups. We conceived of this as our public conscience. I told these men that we didn't want to pick their <coughs> pockets, their pocketbooks, we wanted to pick their business management know-how. And we've gotten in the pocketbook a few times, but we felt that would come. But with the help of Mr. McGee and Mr. Gaylord and a few others, uh, we were able to capture the interest of Henry Bowman, who was governor at that time, and, and Governor Bowman agreed to host a superb group of people who now comprise the Oklahoma Health Sciences Foundation, Incorporated. 
And the goals of that foundation are to attract, encourage, and to assist private and public agencies related to the health sciences and services to locate in a functional relationship to the University Medical Center in accordance to a master plan designed to meet the health manpower needs of all of the people of Oklahoma. There is, there is the preamble to the Constitution for the future of the health care in this state. Mr. Robert Hardy was recruited as executive for the foundation, and you know we stole him from Arkansas, and uh, Dolph Whitten came from over there, so we have to balance these things off now and then. Bob has been a key to the implementation of the health center concept, primarily by liaison with all of the multiple agencies involved, and through the operations committee, which is comprised of the administrative heads of each of the institutions that has been considering locating at the health center. Now the Health Sciences Foundation has sponsored the overall health center campus master planning, and they've served as a liaison agency for the development of coordinated efforts with the city, the county, and the state planning agencies and programs, and uh, with housing and urban development, city uh, chamber of commerce, uh, COPTA, city planning commission, capital zoning. It's a very, very, complex array of, of agencies with whom we deal. The University Medical Center, on the other hand, has its own internal master planning, which is coordinated with the overall health center campus concept. And it is obvious that cooperative arrangements is better to borrow from many agencies and institutions, representing the various firms of government, private foundations, uh, universities, two boards of regents, State Health Department, not to mention the legislature, the governor's interest, becomes a job that requires a lot of communicating, and it requires flexibility. And it was this concern for flexibility that led to my recent stand. It has to be. Until this point, things have worked surprisingly well because we are all dedicated to one common goal. We have different governing boards. We have different sources of financing. We represent different segments of our society. But we have one common goal. And in this state, our, our financial base is such that only by this kind of cooperation and coordination can we become a great center. And this is essential to the economy of this state. If we want industry scattered throughout Oklahoma, we have to have health services available. No industry is moving into an area where they do not have health services available. As Disraeli said years ago, the fate of the nation depends upon the health of its people. Now, even as I prepare to leave Oklahoma, I cannot restrain my enthusiasm when I start discussing the future of the Oklahoma Health Center. How can a program that has been designed to be so responsive to the professional health manpower needs of a state that has such great needs ever fail? You would have to work hard to make this fail at this point. You will also have to work hard to make it succeed. And I remind you that nothing proceeds like success. Time will not permit a detailed review, but the recent growth of the University Medical Center has been phenomenal, both qualitatively and quantitatively. The momentum is there. The course is firmly charted. Superb people who have been deeply involved in developing the planned programs, remain aboard and are in key positions. The student body is enthusiastic, and a large number of the faculty has become sensitive to the social responsibilities of academic medicine. There are $26 million of the 1968 hero bond issue in the state treasury waiting to be matched by federal and other funds to construct the new school of dentistry building 
the Biomedical Sciences Building, the Health Sciences Library, and the School of Health Building. The plans, preliminary drawings, and the grant applications for these facilities are, are in Washington. They are pending, and probably most of the projects will get underway within the next six to 12 months. The State Health Department has already started construction on its very badly needed new facility, which is going to be built just south of the sites for the, the proposed School of Health and the Health Sciences Library buildings. Here again, various agencies with mutual <coughs> relationships. A beautiful new five-story office building is being constructed by the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation at 14th and Phillips, just behind the old medical school building. It's virtually complete. The urban renewal area that provides the site for the proposed $24 million Presbyterian Hospital has been cleared of all buildings and is ready for site development, and it is a beautiful site, and this is just west of the old university hospital. In other words, the health campus is happening. It's not a dream any longer. It's a happening. And if you have not driven out Northeast 13th and 14th and 15th Street and around the block or two in that area, 800 to 600 blocks, Recently, you should go. You will be amazed. It isn't as large as what is going on in downtown Oklahoma City, but it is just as significant. And they are related. Now, I do have some concerns. And I would say from the standpoint of the health center, not the university so much, but still the university. But the health center, I feel that the most critical need at the this moment is for this community to some way find a way to come up with the financing for the Presbyterian Hospital. With Mercy's decision to build in another part of town, and this was basically an economic decision, it has become imperative that the plans for Presbyterian Hospital materialize soon. The projected plans for the new University Hospital these plans were cut by 200 beds because we have planned to utilize the private hospital facilities for teaching. We didn't want to keep on building an ever bigger, bigger, bigger university hospital. Now, the availability of private affiliating teaching a private teaching hospital not only provides the economy in terms of state tax dollars, it combines the excellence of a university faculty and a private clinical staff with teaching resources and personnel for the delivery of superior care and the creation of a model environment for the teaching of clinical medicine. Any idea that will save tax dollars and do a better job at the same time requires implementation. It's not going to happen unless the people in this room roll up their sleeves. It must happen. Until the past few weeks, I have been very concerned with the plans that were emerging from our colleagues on the Norman campus for the reorganization and the restructuring of the administration and the governance of the University of Oklahoma. I'm not going to go into this in detail. I'm sure many of my colleagues do not understand this. I'm not going to dwell on the unfortunate sequence of events except to say that I felt a compelling need to go all out to preserve the integrity of the medical center and the projected health center campus concept. And to see that whomever is to head the medical center has the authority and the flexibility he must have in order to deal with a multitude of people, health agencies that represent city, state, and federal governments as well as the affiliate private agencies and the economically depressed neighborhood, the good citizens of which we must work with and live with. And you haven't heard much from out that way. These are our friends. It's a black neighborhood. And I would remind you that the Jersey City riot was came from just exactly the kind of development we have. An expansion of a medical center into a black, depressed area without dealing with the people as you would want to be dealt with. It wasn't exactly a medical center, but the same thing happened at the Columbia University. 
seen a couple of years ago. We have one of the finest black men I've ever met in an office living in the neighborhood, open door, working for the university. He's there to visit with people, explain to them what's going on. If they have problems, we try to resolve them. And we think we have finally gotten the confidence of most of these people. I think they realize we want to be fair. But this could blow up in a hurry if we are not careful of what we're doing. And you cannot have these kinds of decisions being made by an absentee landlord. And uh, this is really the basis of, of most of my actions. Because my actions could easily have been interpreted as a self-seeking grasp for personal power, I felt from the beginning that it would be necessary to go all out, get up as needed to protect this essential program, and then be prepared to resign. And this is why I refer to my own time here. So stubborn, I think that's the only right thing to do. Maybe I'm wrong. But I agree with the young people. I have a right to dissent and stand up for that in which I believe. I've done so with some sorrow, but no regret. And nothing is in my heart but affection for the scores of people that made the Oklahoma Health Center a model concept for the nation. And it is. Lester Gorslein, who was our uh, consultant early in the game, uh, called me from San Francisco uh, last month and told me that uh, New Orleans, LSU, and Tulane have lifted our concept of a health center almost to a T, including an umbrella foundation. In the area around USC, Los Angeles County Hospital, they're doing the same plan. We were out there as a consultant in December, and a plan is being uh, developed based upon the Oklahoma concept in the East Bay area uh, around the Berkeley, uh, Oakland area campuses. Uh, two weeks from now, I'm going to be at Salt Lake City on a seminar. Uh, <coughs> Dr. Sidney Garfield, who organized and heads up the Kaiser Permanente Plan, is going to talk on the prepaid concept of health care. Uh, a man who is an economist for the uh, AFL-CIO office in Washington is going to talk on Walter Ruther's concept of compulsory national health insurance. And I have been asked to be there to talk about the Oklahoma experiment. And we won't have time to go into this, but our concept actually goes into the three levels of health care and the extension of care into the vacuum area of primary care where no health services are now available. I leave Oklahoma with a sense of accomplishment. And you can't get out Oklahoma out of my blood. I, I, uh, I am rooted here. My parents are buried just 10 miles from here. And uh, I'm going to be back, not to work for you necessarily, I'm just going to be back to see that you do the job. And uh, I'm going to work with it. Foundation and the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation at, at a policy uh, level. And if you can't be an Okie, I guess being an anarchy is the next thing to it. Excuse me, Governor and I. <laughs> and I have to be careful now because I'm uh, I'm caught between uh, Orville Faubus and, and uh, Winthrop Rockefeller over there, and um, it's a tough time. <laughs> but I do believe with every kind state regents are going to do everything in their power to back this concept. I'm confident that our own university regents are going to do so. And dear Pete McCarter, we've known forever, we know that he's going to be with us. 
he'll, he'll make us behave, but he's going to be with us. And I say, and dare I say whomever that may be, but if whomever is the governor and our legislature and the people of Oklahoma will provide the level of support that must be forthcoming, and if the people of Oklahoma City continue to provide support to the private community hospitals as they've always done in the past, this concept will come to fruition. Now, really what we're talking about is an ideal. No one has ever planned a health center that was designed to meet all of the needs of all of the people. And philosophically, this is possible. Practically, it is not. Remember, an ideal is just an idea based upon perfection. This is something our young folks need to remember, too. I ideals and perfection are seldom realized. But by having them and striving to meet the goals and the standards set by ideals, we get down the road and we all perform at a higher level. And the standard is usually that level at which the most people are comfortable and at which most people will work and accept what is required of them. We feel that the principles that have emerged from the concept of the Oklahoma Health Center are the principles of our forefathers, that they fit as well today in our technological society and are perhaps more necessary today than they were in the past. If I gave credit to everyone whom I feel deserves credit, I would have to recognize virtually everyone in this room. I can't do that, and I'm sorry. But I want to tell you that no person ever had a broader base of popular, professional, governmental, official support than I've had. I don't want anyone to feel that I'm leaving because I haven't had support. The cooperation and help from this chamber has been tremendous. I will remind you of another concern. Tulsa has a chamber of commerce, and uh, for some reason, the leader of their chamber is hept on getting a medical school in Tulsa. They, they can't get one very quickly. It's not practical, but they can certainly throw up enough question marks to make it difficult for us. You're going to have to work harder. I can tell you that as these new schools emerge, the budget at the medical center is going to get even higher, ET. And we've got to plan for this. I know he knows that, but I had to say it. He's planning for it, but you have to plan it. And one of the things that worries me about Oklahoma and Arkansas and I understand it because it reflects the struggle of our pioneer parents, and I grew up with it. But that's the philosophy of poverty. How many times do you see something good here by the people? We can't afford it. It's a good idea, but we can't afford it. I was told that when I started the college in the Depression, <laughs> and I couldn't afford it. I couldn't afford it.